Describe in single words only the good things that come into your mind. About your mother? Your mother? Yeah. Let me tell you about my mother. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Have you ever been in an institution? Cells. Cells. Do they keep you in a cell? Cells. Cells. When you're not performing your duties, do they keep you in a little box? Cells. This causes it. This causes it. This causes it. Information overload. All the electronics around you poisoning the airwaves. You are listening to the High Tech Low Life Podcast. A cyberpunk media retrospective, High Tech Low Life contains themes and language not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, everybody, to the High Tech Low Life podcast with your hosts, Eric and Josh. I am Eric. And I am Josh. Coming to you live to tape from the midwest i don't know yeah 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 uh yeah you know fortified compounds etc uh, etc et yeah compounds are always fortified who what are you doing if you aren't fortifying your compound uh, i don't know man it seems like a huge oversight yeah so we're back for another week uh prior to what will be a two to three week break sorry apologies we are no longer hashtag consistent yeah, well, you know, uh, both of our lives involve some travel sometimes. So, you yeah, know. that's Th- true. There's no, there's no saying whose fault the majority of these breaks are. I, I would, you know, there's no, <laughs> no need to assign blame. Oh, I would never. I would never consider it. <laughs> but this time it's my fault. So uh, do with that what you will. Hate me in the comments. Come on, um, haters. We this week are talking about. We're going back to the back to the well, back to old school, back to our roots, bloody roots, back to our roots, bloody roots. Uh, And we're doing Johnny Mnemonic, not the movie to which we have dedicated over 100 hours talking about. Not the novelization of the movie written by Terry Besson. No, although maybe in the future. At some point, um, (laughs) I... I mean, I did see a digital file of it, and I've got the fucking mass market paperback in the basement. (laughs) Also, not the screenplay of the movie. No. Which you also own. It is sitting right in front of me. This is the short story from the short story anthology Burning Chrome that the movie is based upon. Yes, originally published in Omni in 1981. Wow, that was a long time ago. It certainly was. And it's interesting because we've never talked about it. I mean, we've talked about it in passing, but we've never actually like 100 hours talking about Johnny Mnemonic. We never went back and read the source material, which I would say is probably a failing. I uh, I remember very specifically that I did like, I don't know, probably once or twice over the course of um, over the course of doing that show. But it was exclusively because we like saw something and I said, oh, that was really different in the book or in the short story. So, but we never did a a full, you know, breakdown. We should have done an episode on it. You know, that would make sense. I mean, you would say, ah, it's a short story. How can you get a whole episode? And then you remember that uh, every minute of the movie had its own episode. So Mm -hmm. definitely could have, could have. Yeah, I think, I I think we can pull a, uh, tight 115 minutes out of this <laughs> yeah let's 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 keep it to a tight 90 yeah. um before we do that though you know let's let's talk about the world we live in and the the media we're consuming i do want to at the top apologize if i cough into the mic or clear my throat i am very phlegmy today and uh i'm gonna be honest i had a joke for this that i bailed on at the last minute but now i'm gonna say it as oh, the yeah. joke, rather than actually delivering the joke. Okay, great. The joke would have been, uh, call me the ace of spades because I'm Flemmy Killmeister. It, man, I almost said, wait, I'm going to type something in the chat. And it was going to be <laughs> ace of spades, Lemmy. Yes. I think that's why I bailed on it. Yeah. Like, we all knew it was there. It w- The ideal would have been, uh, I say, pause the recording, 
run over to your house, hand you a sealed envelope, <laughs> then, <laughs> then come I can home and have live. you open it on the air. <laughs> we have a winner. Yeah. Um, but the uh, the sentiment remains. I hate clearing my throat on mic, but it might happen. And if yeah. not, if you if you hear this sound, that means I just took care of business off mic. Well, fortunately, our uh, recording method, at least on my end, allows me to uh, just mute, which is very oh, yeah. cool. I guess I could do that too. Yeah, I, I kind of like Libsyn. And we're not sponsored by them, but we are hosted by them. So it, it's certainly more convenient than. Uh, recording in Audacity where there was no possible way to pause. Which is, yeah. um, let's talk about uh, the other stuff. What's the stuff we talk about? How's how's things? Uh, things could be better. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, nori. Yeah, I, I don't know that I want to uh, chat about it on the podcast, but uh, things, things could be going better right now. Um, what about you? You excited <laughs> for your trip? I am. Uh, I'm going, I don't know if I've said this, probably have, I'm going to, uh, Amsterdam and Berlin for two-ish weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I believe you did say that at some point when I was talking about the... Oh, right. Yeah. I remember it now. Yeah. I don't remember this. I remember bringing it up. Um, I'm excited. I'm, uh, nervous about leaving my dog behind. I hate doing that. Yeah, uh, you got uh, boarding, I assume. Yeah, we've got boarding. Usually, like in the past, we've usually had friends or house sitters watch after her, but mm-hmm. that, none were available this time. So we had to go with boarding, and it's a long time to put a dog uh, in that situation. It yeah, feels bad. Yeah, and it's very, very expensive. Yeah, it is not cheap, even slightly. One but, thing I was one thing I was always surprised at is that, like, okay, I got a like fucking 80 pound greyhound and a 65 pound english bull terrier they're both like good sized dogs right Mm -hmm. yes beefy yeah well um, one's beefy the other's just mass wise (laughs) big yeah um and one's beefy the other's beef sorry (laughs) (laughs) and it never ceased to amaze me how to get my fucking 10 pound cat boarded was like five bucks a day cheaper than the dogs. It was. Based, yeah, it's stupid. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the same. Like we our dog is 70 pounds and our previous pet was uh, a little 13 pound, you know. Yeah. Chihuahua mix mutt. And it was the same price, which I mean, I guess is good when you get when you have the bigger dogs, but you kind of wonder why yeah. that is yeah but that's life um i'm excited to be out of america for a while and get some perspective that's for yeah. show well hopefully uh, you'll be able to get back in i have no special information or anything i'm just you know saying <laughs> do you the, the way the world works you know <laughs> yeah it's always a risk but you know what <laughs> who can say <laughs> what's the downside if i don't <laughs> yeah i mean you know the last time i left the country like I thought the same thing and I was like, well, you know, I'm literally five minutes from the border crossing. <sighs> if that closes because of God knows what, while I'm having lunch in the cantina. Oh, well, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Oh, well, uh, I'm fine. I'm fine with the border peoples. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, that type of thing is is there anything in the news worth mentioning? Oh, let's see. UAW is on strike. Still, we talked about yeah that um, a bit last week. Apparently, the uh, the producers uh, went back to the table yesterday for the uh, Writers Guild. Their um, best and final offer. Yes, their best and final and second as offer. If, as if negotiating for people's salaries is like buying a house or a car at auction. Sure, yeah. Um, it exactly is. Uh, I also liked a tweet I saw where it's like, if they don't accept this offer, that's the end of movies and TV forever. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I be- I believe them. Yeah. <laughs> this is definitely a promise they can make and keep. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that, that'll, you know, uh, we we stand with uh, striking workers. Um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. That goes kind of goes without saying, but might as well say it. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think if there is anything else 
big Not that really. happened recently. Um, God, I'm going to feel bad if something really important did happen, and I'm just glossing over it. But oh, no. India assassinated a Canadian guy. So that's, or maybe, maybe. assassinated an Allegedly. Indian guy. So that's interesting. Yeah. We never did talk about the uh, the Vegas casino hack oh, on, yeah. on our actual show. We only mentioned on the Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, I did want to mention it at some point just because of how cyberpunk and Shadowrun it felt when I was reading about it. And I did not, you know, uh, I did not click the article, but apparently it was a gang of youths primarily. You know how I love a good gang of youths. Did they get well, busted? Uh, I believe so. Damn. Would have much preferred the Ocean's Eleven, them standing in front of the uh, Bellagio fountains and slowly walking away one by one. Yeah. Honestly, I I would, uh, I feel like the Ocean's movies would would be good commentaries. for. I agree. (laughs) If we just had nothing, you know, nothing else pressing, like, man, because I rewatched those a while back and boy, that first one is just impeccable as a movie. Yeah, I watched it. I think I think we talked about it on, if not this yeah. show, one of our shows. I watched it last year and twice, I believe. This was on like in a hotel room Yeah, after I'd already watched it. And yeah, it's... I think we spent a lot of time on that movie back when that was happening. I bu- yeah, I think we <laughs> probably did because... Yeah, I think it was like right around the same time that like I watched it randomly and then you ran into it. Yeah, it's... Uh, no, no, no shame. I've not seen any of the others though. Uh, the, I did watch them. Um, uh, 12 is not a, it's not anywhere near as well constructed as the first one, but it's kind of a good hang. If that makes sense. Um, and the third one is my genitals have been described exactly like that. Good hang, yeah. Well, um, not not quite as good as the other ones, but it's a good hang. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's not bad. You're, you're bringing the humor today. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Doing my best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of ashamed. I, I might cut it out. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's nice to have that option on the table. It is. And the third one is, like, good. It's not... It's better put together than the second one, but it's not as loose and fun and easy as the first. And then the uh, lady one, of course, ruined movies. Like it destroyed my childhood. My childhood was killed. I never, never saw it, but my childhood is screaming. Yeah. Um, Kate Blanchett dressed as peak bisexual for the entire film. (sighs) I Pete bisexual. That sounds peak bisexual. (laughs) Sound like a, like a madman character or something. That's what, uh, (laughs) That's what my uh, friend Beth once described it as. <laughs> now I kind of want to watch it. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let's uh, talk about recommendos real quick. I got one. Okay. Uh, I've been, and I don't know if it's a recommendo. It's one of those. I'm watching it, so I'm going to tell you sure. about it. Uh, it's on Apple TV, I believe, and it's uh, The Morning Show. Have you oh. seen the... I am aware of it existing. I kind of know the concept, but I have never watched it. Seen the thumbnails? Yeah. Uh, I would describe it, speaking of Mad Men, kind of like Mad Men in uh, like a TV show situation okay. instead of an ad agency. And I don't think it it quite is done as well as Mad so Men Studio by any means. So 60 on the Sunset Strip? I've never seen that, but sure. Um. I don't know. It's it's in compelling enough that I've enjoyed watching it, though. Mm. And I think if that's the type of thing you're into, you might like it. But you mean content to feed into my brain? Yeah, to, to, exactly. to keep, keep the keep demons the voices, uh, to keep the voices quiet. Yeah, yeah, I'm into exactly. that. <laughs> it's not bad. There are some parts that are like a little hmm, is that uh, whatever you just hand wave it and move on. Sure. Um. Anyway, uh, that's what I've been watching or we've been watching and not hating. Okay. That's something. That's a that's a tepid recommendo. Yeah. I will say there we just started the second season which uh takes place in early 2020, so it's bringing back some things. Oh, sweet. That's uh yeah. Hmm. Good time. I I made a uh Oh, did you forget what happened in 2020? Uh no, what what, what something happened? Uh there I was mean, an election. 
That's oh. all I remember. All right, cool. Okay, that's and it was a, it was a fraudulent election and stop the steal uh, and all that oh, stuff. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Now it's coming back, right? Yeah, yeah. That sounds. That we were robbed sounds of our rightful president, who actually still is president. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is not a message to Q followers. Don't think that it is. I I have a uh, actually a very strong recommendo. Okay. Um, based on a uh, review and recommendation from uh, Chris of the Astronomica podcast, who plays Augie. Cool. Um, and is oh, a, I think I saw you talking about that. And is a film critic. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend the the film Bottoms, which has just this week come out on digital. Um, Ooh, it's on digital. Yes, uh, it stars Ayo Edebiri, um, who is Sydney on The Bear. Yes, um, and in, she's my favorite character on The Bear, by the way. In like five thousand other things over the course of the past six months. She's hot. Um, so hot right now. Yeah, I she is inescapable and I'm fine with that. Agreed. And then uh, uh oh shit what the the other I know the face of the other star yeah, and I she, don't remember her she name. She was in Bodies Bodies Bodies. Rachel Sennett. S E N N O T T question mark. Um her name has a question mark. Interesting. Yes. Stylistic uh, choice by the parents. And and uh Marshawn Lynch who apparently played football hmm. that's um, what i've heard yeah uh, that's what i knew about him before i watched is he movie. like the coach uh sort of yeah in the trailers he seems very funny yeah he was really funny um okay like good. more so than you would expect it's always fun when somebody really talented in one field you find out they're talented at something else it's always a good time yeah and i, I saw a thing apparently most most, if not all, of his stuff was improvised. So oh, good deal. Yeah, uh, I've anyway. been looking forward to that movie. Um, it looks very funny. You know how we love a good coming of age around here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is in. It is incredibly funny and an incredibly gross and heightened version of high school. Like in a in such a recognizable way to me <laughs> like oh yeah this was internally how like internally this is how high school felt yeah. much more than any other like nonsense high school thing <laughs> maybe they'll have it on the plane oh that would be uh i mean y you'll be laughing um it's not a movie that would suffer from a little screen right oh no no it's okay. fine i mean although there are some parts that like you know, we, I, I, there are like a cup, a couple of very short segments uh, where I did think it would have been very funny to see on a big screen, but it did not suffer from being at my house. Okay, unlike a lot of people, <laughs> yes, suffer at your. Never mind. Um, we're super spreaders over here. <laughs> Wait, that happened in 2020. Shit. Oh, it's coming back to you, isn't it? It really is. Okay, well, that's two, well, one solid recommendo and one, eh, if you got the time, hit it, recommendo. Oh, well, I also watched the Barbie movie. Um, First time? Yeah. How'd, yeah, because I, I went and saw Oppenheimer and you went and saw Barbie. Oh, right. Um, we, we did Barbenheimer. We just split it up. Yeah. Uh, because who's got time for that? I thought it was really good. I, I also was, uh, was surprised to see like half the cast of... Uh, um, sex sex education, education in it, which is apparently <laughs> back now. Yes, I I'm, I should probably start that. It was that was strange cameos that I never heard anybody talk about outside of us. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> like if if one, who cares? But there were a lot. <laughs> yeah, there were minimum three, and it's yeah. not impossible that there were more that I either didn't remember were on sex education or right exactly <laughs> missed in the background of weird hats and pink vests it's uh that that was strange but i mean good they're good actors and yeah fun people so yeah i liked it all right let's uh I, let's talk about johnny mnemonic okay that sounds good i guess so did you like it <laughs> um had you uh, read it before hated it i read it in high school like i okay. had very little memory of it i remembered for some reason um the description of Nighttown. Yeah. 
that's like all that like it, it had pretty much all been replaced in my memory by stuff from the movie except from night town being like this inverted bowl mm-hmm. that that stuck that's how i knew i read it you know it's something you read something and yeah yeah that's how i, I knew it's it was a story i had read before plus i remember carrying burning chrome around me that you probably loaned me yeah i assume but i'm i'm guessing it's my ancient 1991 printing yeah mass market paperback right um so yes i had read it uh i didn't remember hardly anything like it wasn't familiar as i was yeah. reading it again I'll, I'll put it that way except for the description of night town um and it's very different from the movie uh yeah i mean you know it's depending on what edition you uh, are looking at somewhere between 12 and 19 pages so uh yeah that's uh it's a bit different i'd also like to say i'm like a firm believer firm i don't know if maybe this hot take isn't very hot at all but um when hey, prepare for a lukewarm take <laughs> yeah lu- lukewarm bath bath water temperature um i like it sometimes when film adaptations are different from what they were based on yeah and i don't think that the movie made many bad choices in how it deviated from the book no i would Uh, like to see like a strict adaptation but also i think they took i don't know uh, what i'm saying is they're they're separate but equal separate but equal is that okay to say i don't think you say that anymore that's fine um (laughs) yeah i i think uh um and a lot of people seem to lose sight of this that uh you know books and films are different mediums with different strengths and weaknesses so it's it's dumb to expect a one-to-one adaptation from especially something like a short story to yeah. a film i mean also the stakes in this short story are so low nothing yeah nothing. i mean one guy's life <laughs> yeah who you don't even know that well like you know nothing about johnny yeah. You just know that he's the narrator, so I guess we're supposed to side with him. Mm-hmm. And he's in trouble. The The movie had to up the stakes a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's it's absolutely, I think the movie is uh, maybe a less than great adaptation of it, but it's taking the general form and doing something vaguely shaped the same. I mean, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, there are definitely some choices they made that I would have, and I don't know if we should discuss them up front or at the end, like compare and contrast the two. I guess we kind of already are, but um, uh, yeah, I don't remember my point. I agree. Okay. (laughs) All right, show over. (laughs) Eric agrees. Um, Okay, so how do we want to do this? Like, you know, just kind of run through it, sort of plotty? Um, yeah, there ain't a lot. <laughs> and maybe that's how we can compare and contrast. Yeah. Just go go through the plot points of the movie. And in fact, I should probably pull the story up. Now. I have already done so. Um, It starts out in Ralphie's bar, except I don't think it's his bar in the nope. story. He's just a guy that goes there. Nope. It's the Drome. The Drome, right? Yeah. Theoretically, the same club that, you know, we see in the movie. Let's talk about ralphie Uh, well no it starts it technically starts out with johnny talking about how he makes his own shotgun shells yeah i think that's a uh, very cottage core of him uh, yeah quite cottage core um and that's a very important point um the like one of the main sticking points or the main sticky bits of this story is the is when johnny says if they think you're crude go technical if they think you're technical go crude Mm -hmm. um which ends up being kind of the decisive factor to some extent. Um, True. And it's also like, okay, actually, uh, number one, I think maybe, let me, let me look real quick. Like the uh, one interesting thing for William Gibson's Oove is that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh word in this short story is Adidas, which... (laughs) Might be the first real brand name in William Gibson's writing. I didn't go through and like, you know, run down which stories were first, but 
with the way um, Gibson has been writing for literally the past 40 fucking years now, um, name, you know, brand names are a big repeated thing. Like true. He conveys a lot through, you know, what brand a character is using of something. Yeah. The other big brand in this story is Ono Sendai gets dropped, but that, yeah. that and Adidas are like the two. Yeah. And Ono Sendai is not a real thing. Right. Yeah. Neither is Adidas. No, it's not. I don't believe in it. I believe in Adidas, my friend. All day I dream about sex, baby. <laughs> Remember when that was cool? It's cool. No. Corn. It's corn. It was a corn song, right? That's a corn song? I think it was a corn song. I, I'm just going to isolate the all day I dream about sex baby line. Yeah, sure. For future use. All right. Um, so, yeah, Johnny, um, because Ralphie thinks he's technical, Johnny um, reverse engineers a shotgun. <laughs> or okay, shotgun here's, shells, actually. Here's my, my first plot failing. Why did Johnny only make two shells? Because he mostly intended it as a threat. Tr- yeah, true. But man, I mean, how... It would have been super convenient if he like just made four so he could use the thing twice. It would have. But also, I don't know when he would have. I mean, you know, because what? He's going to fucking reload a break barrel shotgun right after he right after Ralphie gets sliced into thirds. And uh... I, I would agree with that, except for the fact that at the end of the story, uh, Johnny mentions holding on to the shotgun and it's it's heft feeling comforting. Yeah. Um, so he could have reloaded it on their trek yeah, up through Nighttown. That's, that's true, but I don't think it would have done any good. It wouldn't have changed the story at all, but it, yeah. But I, I feel like I would make a few spares. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I would as well. Um, but but he know. is a technical boy. He's not yeah. a low tech. No, he is definitely not. We'll find that out. So Johnny's going to go to meet Ralphie because he has quote, hundreds of megabytes of Ralphie's data stuck in his head. Um, A huge amount. Unfathomable. Yeah. Unfathomable. Um, and in this story, he is more cold storage as opposed to a courier. Right. Um, there's no, I mean, all of this takes place in, you know, the sprawl within a couple of miles. You know, everything's on foot and... You know, there's no cool international travel or anything. So even if he does occasionally work as a courier in this one, it was Ralphie stuck some data in his head and then, you know, he hangs around until it needs to come out. Yeah. Like, a yeah, cold storage, I guess that's smart way to put it. And then Ralphie Warm put storage. out a, Yeah. And then Ralphie put out a contract on his life, he heard. So... And isn't taking his calls. So that's where we're at at the beginning. Yep. He uses immaculate procedure um, to get to the club with his exciting new face. Um, a face named Eddie Bax. Mm-hmm. Um, and wardrobe. And he's got, you know, an Adidas bag filled with tube socks and a shotgun. I feel like tube socks really placed it in a certain time. I don't know. White tube socks feels very early 80s. It, to me. And, and an Adidas bag. An Adidas mean, bag, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he uh, goes to the club. The Magnetic Dog Sisters are on the door, who uh, we really liked in the movie. Um, right. They're just kind of background characters in this. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what a great character concepts. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're really great. And it makes it like... The one detail of uh, Johnny says, you know, he can never remember which one was originally male Mm -hmm. uh, makes the story feel much more present tense than like just seeing trans people existing. Yeah. You know, is a much more modern thing than 1981, I guess. True. Although they could have been trying to. Yeah. Yeah. A- alienize it and to make it the world, you know, that's the word I'm looking for. You know how they use Orientalism to make it feel more foreign? Yes. Even though you're still in America. They could have been, William Gibson could have been going for a little of that. I don't want to give I, it too much credit. Yeah. I, I assume <laughs> there is some of that, but it's also just the way it's addressed, very matter of fact, yeah. is 
you know, that's a good, good move on his part. There's not a hat hung on it. It's just a yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, so we meet up with Ralphie and his bodyguard, Lewis. Um, Ralphie uh, does not have the face that he was born with. Uh, he looks, he famously looks and has for decades looked like uh, the famous um, race rock lead singer, Christian White. Yeah, of the Aryan reggae band. This whole yeah. thing was very confusing to me. Uh, fair enough. I mean, to be fair, yeah, it's kind of confusing. Just like, oh, that would be a thing? Yeah, sure, why wouldn't that be a thing? Um, a fucking reggae band from 20 years ago or something that nobody gives a shit about except for him. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely got bands that I would base my whole personality around that nobody gives a shit about except for sure. me and a handful of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's kind of how we, what we based our whole personalities on growing up, if we're being honest. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I am not disputing that even a little bit. Only with the internet coming around did we realize these bands actually had whole fan bases. I know. It's fucking weird. <laughs> um, so Johnny sits down. Ralphie recognizes him pretty much instantly. Um, and he is suddenly paralyzed by a neural disruptor under the table. Um, it is not explained where a neural disruptor is, but you know, who cares? Doesn't matter. Assuming it only works on wired brains or maybe it's, maybe it was in the data he gave Johnny cause it only affects Johnny. Uh, I'm assuming it's just a short range, you know, I've always assumed it's some sort of very short range thingamajig. Yeah. I mean, I don't, it doesn't hugely I mean, we don't need matter. To get that technical. Yeah. So it turns out, as uh, Ralphie explains, that the data was stolen from the Yakuza by somebody stupid who is now dead. Mm -hmm. And the Yaks had it from God knows who. Doesn't matter. Um, then we get a uh, the first mention of squids, because the Yaks are aware of this, um, which will come up later. Uh and it's entirely unclear, and Johnny mentions that we don't really talk about that in the uh, storage business, um, but it's implied that they can, you know, sweep data out, even if it's been deleted or whatever, and there's absolutely no, there's no, I, there's no clear concept that these are not some sort of weird little fucking Matrix robots, or, you know, something else. I do feel like this is kind of a failing of the story just because it's so short the mm -hmm. fact that they mention squibs like right as i keep saying they when it should be he i guess mm -hmm. but as um it's being described what johnny is and what he does and they have to mention squibs at the same time it it lowers the uh, it lowers i felt like in the movie jones was one of a few a few creatures that could have save that could have helped Johnny. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what they're getting at in the book, but just the fact that it's so short and they have to spend that much time talking about squids feel, makes it feel like they're more common. Does, okay. What I'm saying makes sense. Um, I think so. I don't, th I don't think I read it the same way. It um, just felt like given that this, this is a secure way to store data except for this one really insecure part that we don't like to talk about but it definitely exists and it's out there and the yakuza know it's out there so they got to kill me that is i don't know i don't know how else you would have done it <laughs> and kept the story together yeah but. uh I, I don't uh, yeah i don't read it the same way uh i think my my understanding is that he doesn't talk about it number one because it makes clients feel less secure and number well, yeah. two because it's um, it's very rare and, you know, something that would cost a lot of money or technical effort to access. In a, in a longer novel, I feel like they would have broached the topic of squids later. Like Johnny would be in a conversation with somebody and they'd be like, what about squids? Yeah. And he'd be like, oh, I can't afford one of those. Or, you know, yeah. those are so hard to find. But the fact that he just, whatever, I'm critiquing. Yeah fucking one of the best sci-fi authors of all time one of his first stories so i i'm an asshole well that's absolutely true but that is our job here that is <laughs> that is exactly what we do someday we're gonna fucking eviscerate blade runner up in this bitch oh yeah it's going down we hate that movie i don't i love that movie <laughs> um 
so yeah, uh, Johnny gets uh, Johnny gets paralyzed, um, and then we have uh, the incredible introduction of Molly Millions. Yeah, uh, she walks up to the table, <laughs> sell fake, not really selling uh, freebase, mm-hmm. and uh, then when Lewis tries to uh, you know intervene, she. Uh, cuts his hand very badly with her hand razors. Um, I'm going to be honest, even though they're, they're different enough. I, as I'm reading this, I'm imagining Johnny as Keanu Reeves. I'm imagining Ralphie as uh, uh, Udo Kier. Kier? Yeah. Yeah. But I cannot imagine Molly millions as um, uh, shit. Why am I brain blanking? Uh, Dana? Nope. Um, Dina Meyer. Dina Meyer. Yes. Uh, Because I feel like Jane and Molly, are, are very different. Yes, I I absolutely agree. I mean, Jane is clearly based on Molly. Yeah, but definitely not the same. But, and yeah, and I've Molly has become more like Molly from Neuromancer. And yeah, Molly. I mean, you know, if nothing else, based on the amount of time we've spent with them, uh, you know, Molly is the much more developed. I yes, mean, you know, she exists entirely outside <laughs> anything that might resemble the movie. Although I, I mean, would say this Molly is, and it could be attributed to her age, but she's much yeah. different from the Molly in Neuromancer. She is. And definitely uh, Mona Lisa Overdrive. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it, I don't know if there's anybody who has done it, but I think there would be, there could be a fairly interesting paper on the changing characterizations of Molly Millions between this and uh, Mona Lisa Overdrive. Like, how how her character changes between books. Um, yeah. There's... I mean, she's been through some shit. Because she is absolutely... Even though it seems like she kind of ought to be, like, uh, Razor Girl uh, cuts people up. Mercenary. Yeah. Uh, she goes through some huge character changes, like not even in the course of the novels, but she has like full, she has, you know, many experiences between the novels that change her. All right. Just between this and Neuromancer, like she seems mm-hmm. in this book, like a thrill seeker. Yeah. Like a, and she obviously wants to work like she's new. She's trying to get her foot in the door. So she's, mm-hmm. this is a weird way to get work, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, big well, swing, I mean, we'll call it. You know, you take out uh, take out his bodyguard. He needs no bodyguard. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of what Jane did in the yeah, sort of. Um, but then she's much more professional in Neuromancer. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's calmed down a little bit. Um, not uh, quite so jumpy. Yeah, at opportunity. Uh, so anyway, it, you're right. It would be interesting to see a full breakdown. Yeah. So she wants a job. As a uh, bodyguard, uh, Ralphie says no um, and offers her a quarter mil to uh, just walk away from the table. Um, she says no, she wants a real job. Uh, and Johnny, she cuts off the uh, the neural disruptor and Johnny offers her two million to uh, take him away and protect him. And she's like, fucking Natch, great. Is this a sign that uh, inflation's gone out of control, or is Johnny just really rich? Uh, un- good question. Um, because Ralphie offers her a quarter million just to leave. That seems like a lot. Yeah, unclear. I I honestly had never really thought about that, huh? Because we don't really get any. We don't this get is the any only mention of money. Money talk in the entire story, unless it's. Unless it's like just tossed away in the pirate broadcast section. Yeah, I don't think it is. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, we'll never know the answer. We never will. Um, Unless we get Gibson on to interview, which I've already shot that opportunity when yeah. I was talking trash on just motherfucking him <laughs> for <laughs> no <laughs> reason. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, one thing that I thought was important to mention in this section is that uh, we don't get the description of the hand raisers at this point. No. Um, 
Lewis reaches out and then suddenly Molly moves really blurry fast and he's bleeding like quite a bit. And also uh, scene taken directly in by the movie, by the way. Yeah. And also that uh, uh, Molly is wearing leather jeans, the color of dried blood, which uh, comes back like the she's like a couple of times. Apparently she likes that color. Because that pops up a few times over the course of the novels. Huh. I never yeah. noticed that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, when uh, uh, the little girl in Mona Lisa Overdrive is, I think, first describing Kumiko, uh, Sally. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, when she's first describing Sally, uh, it's mentioned she's wearing jeans, you know, jeans the color of dried blood. And then in like... Th- two pages in the story it mentions her nails are burgundy and that comes up a number of times. So she likes red. Yeah. That, that tips me up. Like that's the thing in my mind, like anything in Gibson that is mentioned as burgundy or like, you know, the color of dried blood, I go, Oh, he's evoking Molly here. What are we doing? Okay. Yeah. You mean even outside of sprawl books? Yeah, it doesn't come up very often, but there's a couple there's a couple of points where um that will be referenced and it makes sense like he uh, as it turns out, the guy's a pretty good writer and has some idea of his audience. Yeah, I agree to um, disagree. So he is uh subconsciously signaling like, "Oh, something is about to jump the fuck off." Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh they take Ralphie away because um, Johnny needs him to unlock the data uh, and hopefully get the Yakuza off his back. And his back is a, so they walk out of the club. Um, Molly is chatting with the magnetic dog sisters. And then we get introduced to a tourist in a Hawaiian shirt and flip flops. Looks like a salary man um, out on a uh, long weekend. And then he does a uh, magic trick. Yeah. Hit the tip of his thumb drops off um, as he slightly bows. And then uh, Ralphie is in three pieces. Um, <laughs> it, and Johnny sees the geodesics, the geodesic domes overhead. <laughs> I really like this version of the assassin. Mm hmm. Um, he's just described as like, like a smiley tourist. Yeah. Especially for the final fight, how he comes onto the killing floor. I, I think he's, he's, he's a lot more intimidating this way than they made him in the movie. Although not that he wasn't intimidating in the movie. Yeah. But, uh, just the, the smiley tourist guy seems a lot scarier. Yeah. Um, it's also, I don't know, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. This is it's a very different thing than what we got in the movie. Yes, very different. This isn't a strike team. This is a dude mm-hmm. <laughs> who happens to be a ninja. Yeah. Um, and one one thing that uh, Johnny says in the in recalling this, he says, and playback on full recall suggest suggests he you know slices up. Ralphie and whatever, which I'd never noticed before I read it this time. Um, but I'm not sure if that's uh, if that's a reference to like a mod Johnny has or something. See, I did re- notice that and I was wondering the same thing. I kind of feel like it is like he's got the ability yeah, to play back his memories like it had never occurred to me it, or it, either that or it's just an expression they use. Yeah. But. It, it had never occurred to me before, but it's just, you know, something that stuck out to me at this point. But then also I'm reading it through this time with the idea of fucking discussing it. Yeah, if you're not just not just for fun. Yeah. So, yeah, that was an interesting thing. I kind of I kind of read it differently than I normally do. So, yeah, Ralphie dies. Uh, Johnny <laughs> fires the shotgun uh, <laughs> and misses uh, at, you know probably eight feet with a uh, 12 gauge. A lot of socks in the way. So the ninja's fast. 
Very fast. That's he's wired. Yes, and uh, Johnny is covered in fluff for the rest of the story because the socks just basically detonated. Yeah. Um, so uh, he and Molly fucking run. Um, and they run to Night Town, the pit, where low techs crouch in the dark like gargoyles with black market cigarettes dangling from their lips. It's a pretty good line of prose. It's not bad. The guy's an okay writer. I mean, I know you disagree. But... Oh, I hate the man. Can't yeah. stand it. <laughs> Can't stand him in everything his work has spawned. Yep. To be honest. Okay. So um, Molly at this point, Johnny is honestly a secondary character in the second half of the story. Or. Uh, yeah. It's kind of a second person storytelling situation. Yeah. Um, Molly tries to figure out a plan. Johnny has no plan. Um, He's, He's really, his plan was offer her a lot of money and, <laughs> and hang on for dear life. Yeah, pretty much. Which, smart. Yeah. Um, uh, a, a smart businessman knows when to hire smarter businessmen. Yes. Uh, so Molly tries to figure out a plan, like how tight is Johnny's data locked down? Oh, um, real quick. I think you also forgot to mention when um, Molly sees the assassin, mm -hmm. she's uh, kind of riled up by that. She wants to fight this dude yes she is like sploosh yeah uh, I, she is looking to take him down i guess just for the the street cred yeah okay. um yeah uh she says uh well johnny talking about johnny being covered in scorched white fluff <laughs> um <laughs> i don't see how the hell i missed him and she says because he's fast so fast she hugged her knees and rocked back and forth on her boot heels. His <laughs> nervous system jacked up. He's factory custom. She grinned and gave a little squeal of delight. I'm going to get that boy tonight. He's the best. Number one. Top dollar. State of the art. Yeah. And then Johnny talks about how uh, he's probably mostly vat gr or mostly grown in a vat in Chiba City. Um, and Molly says, Chiba, yeah, see? Molly's been to Chiba too. And, uh, Extends her fingers and the uh, blades come out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The famous hand raisers. Yep. Which were sadly done away with in the film. But, you know. Yeah. Why? I guess that'd be kind of difficult to show. It's a little. Yeah. Um, they gave her that little weird extendable whip thing instead. Yeah. And that makes for even though it wasn't used a ton uh, her just running her hands up somebody is not the most uh, exciting and interesting combat you can do on a film. Yeah. I would also like to point out, this is the first time I've noticed in a description of Molly that her eye shields, like, start at her cheekbones and literally, they, they're like, I mm -hmm. always imagined them just, like, covering her eyeballs. Oh, no, no. She's, but they're uh... like, it's like her whole goddamn ocular cavity. Yeah. Yeah, she, uh, yeah, they're, I don't know, like, uh, slightly molded aviator shades built yeah. into her face. Yeah. I think it was tainted by too many, uh, Shadowrun art, artist depictions. Yeah. Of chrome eyes that weren't like the whole thing. That's, uh, yeah. And that it's Molly is that way through the, through all of it. At one point you might remember, um, in Neuromancer, uh, uh, Molly brushes Case's hands away from her face uh, to prevent fingerprints. Oh. Hmm. Because she, I mean, if they were just her eyes, it wouldn't matter if he... He wouldn't be touching her eyes. Yeah. Unless he's a weirdo. A uh, unless he's a weirdo. And also they would have been wiped clean by her uh, eyelids. So. True. The human windshield wipers. Eyelids. Yes. Don't forget to change your eyelids. Winter's coming. Absolutely true. Hey, we're getting there. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Where the fuck was I? So they're going into night town. Um, so uh, it's at this point that Johnny mentions squids. Um, and uh, let's see. where Where's the line? Okay, so Johnny talks about blah, blah, blah. Squid, uh, Molly says, squids? Crawly things with arms? Um and Johnny explained superconducting quantum interface detectors or interference detectors. Use them in the war to find submarines, suss out enemy cyber systems. And she's like, yeah, Navy stuff from the war. 
This was where she was the most like uh, Jane in the movie, yeah. by the way. Just Sig Navy stuff. Yeah. Um, and she's got an idea. Um, so, yeah, we, we get an idea. So we go see the fish. It's a fish. <laughs> <laughs> the um, war whale, as they call it, which is pretty cool. Pretty fucking sweet. Um, yeah, so uh, Jones makes me sad. Um, yeah. The the way he's described as living in a small tank in a theme park. And yeah, so kids can talk to him. Yeah, uh, his comms are through ASCII. So speaking of the ASCII, um, I originally listened to this on audiobook, as I usually oh, do. I, yes, I definitely wanted to see how that read for, or how that came across for you. Well, I'm here to tell you, it didn't read. They didn't mention it. He just kept reading as if the ASCII parts never existed. And oh. I was confused, especially oh. when he starts talking about a swastika. I'm like, what the fuck? Um, yeah. This morning, I reread the story on one of the links you linked on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sorry, X. And no, I, <laughs> I saw that there was a whole bunch of stuff that the audiobook left out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I... This whole scene made. Oh, actually, I think I think. Did you skip the pirate part or did that come after? No, part? that's after. OK. Yeah. But yeah, this. Um, nonsensical in the audiobook. Weird, yeah. weird choice that they made. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, uh, basically Jones communicates in ASCII art. Um, and, um, his first block. Right. Not, for anybody under the age of 40, oh. ASCII art is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. It's good art note. made with, uh, with characters on a keyboard, like, combining the letters and numbers and symbols to make pictures. Yeah. Um, so uh, apparently in the Navy, they had Jones wired up to some sort of cool fucking display where he could communicate fully. But after he was uh, pushed out, um, they hooked him up to what amounts to a fucking light bright at this carnival. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Um, which did not come across in the audio at, yeah, at all. Yeah, I, I, it occurred to me when I was reading through this the other day, like, I wonder how that's going to work with the audiobook, assuming Eric hears an audiobook of it, because I glanced around for the audio and did not find anything that I found particularly I, worth linking, so. I bit the bullet and got an audio, an audible yeah. uh, membership. Free trial so far. I might cancel it before the free trial ends. Yeah. But, um. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it turns out that uh, so we communicate with Jonesy. Um, uh, Molly gives him some dope because that's uh, the only joy he can experience. How's a? I can see them slipping up when he was demobbed, letting him out of the Navy with that gear intact. But how does a cybernetic dolphin get wired to smack the war? She said they all were. Navy did it. How else are you going to get him working for you? Yeah. Which, yeah. Again, sad. Sad. Um, Realistic. Yeah, very. <laughs> like, extraordinarily. Extraordinarily. So, yeah, he communicates the, path quote, pathetic password that Ralphie uh, set up. Yeah, he could have guessed it. I feel like, I, feel like uh, I could have guessed it. Uh, yeah. Um, and then they go to a uh, satellite broadcast pilot, pirate. And... Um, Basically, Johnny spits out part of the program, um, and they, through a number of uh, dropouts, try to communicate to the Yakuza that, okay, we've got your program. If you ease up and call off the dogs, then we'll give it back to you. But if... Call off the dogs isn't the best phrasing, considering... Oh, good point. Who Johnny's going to go meet. Although I do think they actually very specifically um, use that. Okay, I believe you. Um, let me, it's, it would be like, okay, man, it's probably later. Um, so, yeah, basically, call off your assassin or else we're going to wideband this. Um, and then they just hope that it all gets through. Um, and it turns because they out, know the yakuza is looking. This yeah. is when they talk about how nobody truly has privacy anymore. Hmm, prophetic. 
Yeah. Oh, and state weird. that everybody leaves a trail, everybody can be tracked. And uh, that's some ahead of its time shit in 1981. Yes. Um, uh, so it turns out that the, uh, that the password uh, communicated in ASCII art was Christian White and his Aryan reggae band. <laughs> Yeah. Faithful Ralphie, a fan to his dying day. Um, yeah. <laughs> poor dumb bastard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so then they are heading for something that could potentially resemble something resembling safety. I feel like we haven't fully expressed the absurdity of an Aryan reggae band. I mean, I mean, I, it kind of uh, goes without saying, but my yeah, God, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we have not addressed it because on its face, it is complete nonsense. On the other hand, I mean, you know, had you told me in 2001 that the next big thing was going to be Aryan reggae, I'd be like, yeah, that all sure. sounds right. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, why not? And I mean, it might be like, you know, tomorrow fucking that rich man north of R- Richmond guy, or the <laughs> next version of him could be doing reggae. That's true. So they go climbing. And climbing into the inverted bowl. Yes. Um, one major difference between this story and the film is that, um, you know, the low tech Headquarters is not on an abandoned, destroyed bridge, but rather up at the very top of the southernmost geodesic dome in uh, the local sprawl area. Yeah. I like how they describe Night City. It's always night, even at noon, because the the dome has been charred black from cook fires. Torches. Yeah. Yeah, because technology is more sparse around here yeah so yeah it pays no taxes and no utilities the neon arcs are dead and the geodesics have been smoked black by decades of cooking fires in the near total darkness of a night town noon who knows this is a few dozen mad children lost in the rafters right um like rats in the walls of the world exactly um so they're climbing they're climbing and Johnny's like, okay, so who's low tech? And uh, Jane explains that it ain't us. Um, low technique and low technology. Um, and low techs, they'd think that shotgun trick of yours was a feat. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny. Um, <laughs> so then we run into our first low tech. His name's Dog. And Sad the dog didn't make the movie. Yeah. I, I think they, he's supposed to be J Bone, probably, but uh, no, I think they tried a little bit with um, the older of the guys um, who are guarding the bug oh, watcher. Yeah, yeah uh, because he's got like I don't know the rhythm that that guy spoke with. He sort of seemed like this. I I don't know. I, I can't. I honestly can't tell you what made me think it, but. Well, dog so, is genetically, well, not genetically, but modified to look like a dog. He's pretty terrifying the way it's described. Yeah. Um, he only has one eye and has a uh, thick grayish tongue with huge canines. Um, and Johnny wonders how they wrote off uh, tooth blood transplants from Dobermans as low technology. Yeah. But whatever. Um, and then he drools. <laughs> he drools yeah he, yeah i wonder if he pants he probably pants too i'm sure he does uh and turns out do- according to dog they're being followed by somebody without a light um he's been aware of them for quite a fucking while because they have all sorts of wires and cables sprung strung up through the approach that'll vibrate when people are moving around right um they also can use that to communicate. Yes. Uh, and it's at this point that Molly, who the gang owes a few favors, the low techs owe a few favors to, I guess, um, negotiates for the use of, quote, the floor and music. And uh, he, uh, Dog, communicates this up the ladder in a yeah. metaphorical sense and literal sense. 
Um, so the people up top will be uh, ready for Johnny and Molly to arrive. Yep. And this is the point at which um, this is where Johnny explains what the data probably is um, and how they communicated to the uh, Yaks. Mm-hmm. And um, it's probably some research data that the Yakuza stole from Ono Sendai um, or a big corporation and are just ransoming it back to them. Yep. Um, so that's probably where they are. Low um, stakes. Yeah. Not like the movie. No, we're not saving the world. There's no NAS in this. Yeah. Um, so they keep climbing. Um, and eventually they reach the killing floor, which... Uh, would you like to describe it or do you want me to? I think you're going to have to because I was kind of confused by it. Um, it's basically a big arena mm-hmm. where and, and I've it's 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 it moves like yes. it's suspended on wires or something and it undulates with people's mm-hmm. weight. Um, yeah. So somebody somebody used to that would have a distinct advantage against somebody who isn't. Yes. Um, so, all right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's the, uh, here's the description from the book. And I think he, he gets, uh, Mr. Gibson gets a little, uh, literary with this, uh, part. So the killing floor was eight meters on a side. A giant had threaded steel cable back and forth through a junkyard and drawn it all taut. It creaked when it moved, and it moved constantly, swaying and bucking as the gathering of low techs arranged themselves on a shelf of plywood surrounding it. The wood was, sil- was silver with age, polished with long and deeply etched with initial, er, polished with long use and deeply etched with initials, threats, declarations of passion. There was this was suspended from a separate set of cables, which lost themselves in the darkness beyond the raw white glare of two ancient floodlights suspended above the floor. So. So none of it's up to code. No, definitely. Uh, there is no OSHA up here. An inspector has not seen this for God knows how long. Yeah, they should really get that fixed. So yeah, imagine a scrapyard that just has, say, hundreds of steel cables strung through it to make a generally levelish floor. But it's all going to move based on where you happen to be standing and how much you're moving. Yeah, um, okay, I guess I was was just reading it right. It just it's yeah, kind it's, of an absurd thing to visualize. Yeah, it is, and it's also a very fucking cool thing to visualize. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and we kind of we got a little bit of it in the in the movie uh, in those uh, sections where we were where they were going from where they entered the bridge to heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, where everything's just kind of strung together and hanging. Yeah. I, I, they definitely, the movie evoked it, kind of, if not actually showing it. Because it would have been yeah. really hard to put oh, on yeah. film. Yeah, it definitely would have. Um, and what they came up with for Heaven was pretty cool, too. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was very, uh, very different and what it needed to be for the movie. Yeah. So we're uh, surrounded now by low techs. Um, Johnny has the uh, shotgun under his jacket. He's just kind of st- stuck out there like bait, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Molly's, he can't find Molly at that point. Yeah, she uh, kind of disappears on him uh, <laughs> while he's having a little bit of culture shock. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> low-tech fashion runs to scars and tattoos, uh, which much that's... Like uh, human fashion. Yeah, that's a, that's a line that uh, pops up Again, at least one more time in uh, William Gibson's Oove. Um, I think in uh, the Perry Farrell in the book, not the show. Not the lead singer of Jane's Addiction. Was he Jane's Addiction? Yes, that oh. is correct. Also, Whew. porno for took, pyros. Took a step. Yep. Uh, it took me like, I don't know, 20 years of being aware of him before somebody informed me that Perry Farrell was his attempt at a joke punk name. Okay, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I that mean, was his name. Because it's loose. It's very <laughs> like, loose. Like, And both okay, both are actual, like, names. I, I, can, I can see where you, how you can get there, but 
that's not going to be an automatic get for anybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's no Joe Strummer. Or, yeah. <laughs> or Jerry only. Yeah. Um, so uh, then the ninja arrives on the opposite side of the floor and starts walking to Johnny very calmly. He he steps in smiling, takes sets his sandals aside. Yes. And the fact that he's wearing sandals the whole time is pretty awesome, too. And and not just sandals, fucking flip flops. I mean, Zor- <laughs> Zori's are just flip flops. <laughs> and then approaches the floor. Th- that's intimidating shit. Like mm-hmm. the, the guy they had in the movie, like he looked badass. Yeah. De- Dennis, I think is his real name. Yes. Uh, I don't remember his last name, but yeah, Dennis, I think was his first. Um, He, he fucking ruled, but I, I'm sorry, a guy in a Hawaiian shirt and, and flip flops is scarier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it definitely has a level, especially surrounded where fashion runs to scars and tattoos. Right. In a, fucking suspended soot covered junkyard he's walking on looking like mr magoo yeah um that is a level of threat which is unreasonable i mean (laughs) that's like if a fish pulled a gun out on you (laughs) (laughs) like you're kayaking and then suddenly a dolphin pulls a submachine gun and points it at you like oh okay this is just entirely turned on me no idea what to do um yeah, so he's gonna go. He's uh, gonna come over and uh, take Johnny's head, uh, and all of the uh, low techs become quiet, and Molly's gone. So the low techs kind of part to let him step onto uh, the killing floor, and he then walks across it or starts walking across it, and quote Molly hit the floor, moving the floor screamed. <laughs> So it turns out that the floor is somehow all mic'd and amplified with contact mics and God knows what else. Yeah. Um, and there are some giant fucking speakers overhead uh, where a uh, drum beat then begins to uh, emanate from. So we're at the most psychotic uh, industrial concert of all time. Yeah, basically. Yeah. We're talking fucking <clears throat> Ister Zonde Nubatan circa 1992 you know an empty warehouse in east berlin shit (laughs) (laughs) um and then uh she kind of dances yeah um she starts molly moves around and uh, she's getting comfortable on the floor and uh, let's see the killing floor. It show, she flexed her knee or she flexed her knees, white feet tensed on a flattened gas tank and the killing floor began to heave in response. The sound it made was like a world ending, <laughs> like the wires that hold heaven snapping and coiling across the sky. So that's a pretty cool way. Like this would be a fucking sweet way to end a movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it's not, it's not a great way to end the movie that they ended up making. No. Um, but this is a sweet way to end the fucking movie. If you could film it. That, yeah. I'm not a director, obviously, but I, I don't have that vision of how you would make it work. You know, I think uh, you would need you definitely need somebody who is good. Yeah. Um, I, I think, honestly, you could probably do it pretty well nowadays especially with the advancements in uh, digital cameras and stuff where they can be very fucking small comparatively um well think about uh, alita battle angel Mm -hmm. like that's a movie that would have the technology to do this they could cg everything yeah but i don't know i i just even with that technology just visualizing what he's describing is is difficult for me Mm -hmm. Well, that, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be doable. It'd be a giant pain in the fucking ass. And, and getting the sound right would be very important, I feel like. Yeah, it'd be one of those things <clears throat> where you'd have to, like, as soon as this happened, like, as soon as it says the floor screamed, 
Yeah. You would have to like fucking overdrive every speaker in the theater by like 50% of every peak you've had so far. Like it would suddenly just blow people's goddamn eardrums out. And that'd be great. I would love to see that. Well, we did spend our lives going to thrash metal shows. So exactly. We like noise. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So uh, then he, uh, the Yakuza um, sends his thumb tip out and starts spinning around and Molly's bouncing. Yeah. Molly's bouncing and bouncing and um, uh, she wins. Yeah, the fight itself is, doesn't take very long, which I, I like. It reminded me reminded yeah. me of your standard Shadowrun game where you spend three hours doing a combat that in game takes 16 seconds. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is also, you know, this is another thing that um, Gibson can, continues to tend to use. He doesn't like doing fight scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Fight scenes are not that interesting to him in terms of the actual writing and. Um, also just like he, he really much prefers to do like the action packed climaxes somehow off screen. Right. You know, because the action packed stuff isn't kind of the important thing. Um, that said, it's still cool. Like he, he tries to whip Molly. She uses the floor to her advantage Mm -hmm. and makes him cut his own hand off. And then rather than get razored up by Molly, he just jumps through a gap just dives through the floor yeah takes his takes himself out which is pretty badass yeah he went through it like a diver with a strange deliberate grace a defeated kamikaze on his way down to night town partly i think he took the dive to buy himself a few seconds of dignity of the dignity of silence yeah she she'd killed him with culture shock so interesting yeah um they never found the hand it's still out there yeah all we found was a graceful curve in one piece of rusted steel where the molecule went through its edge was as was bright as new chrome yeah so that's the end of the story effectively um they never there's a to... there's a denouement johnny yeah. johnny moves in with jones they start a business fighting crime <laughs> yeah they, they uh they never hear from the yakuza one way or the other um but at least as of the end of this story, roughly a year later, uh, they haven't sent any more assassins. It's a good sign. Um, and yeah, Johnny is living up in uh, up in the dome. His teeth buds are growing in, um, and they got a fun little business. Uh, him and Joan Jones is searching out the traces of the data he's had before, um, and he and Molly are blackmailing the former clients. And things are going great. Yeah. And with Jones to help me figure things out, I'm getting to be the most technical boy in town. Now, it doesn't in Neuromancer, or maybe it's Mona Lisa Overdrive, doesn't Molly hint at what happened to Johnny or why they went yep. separate ways? Yep, it's Neuromancer. Um, uh, spoilers for Neuromancer. Yeah, if you haven't, um, which this is our about, first episode. Which we talked about 20 episodes ago. <laughs> Um, 22 episodes ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Molly and Johnny after sometime after this, uh, are traveling around. They're in a nice hotel and Molly runs into a, uh, in Neuromancer, Molly runs into another Yakuza assassin. Um, and, uh, she remarks that she's seen one like him before and that he's the guy who, she was walking out of the lobby of, a, or walking into a, the lobby of a hotel she was staying at with her former boyfriend, who is implied to be Johnny. Um, and the Yakuza assassin is walking out, having just killed Johnny. Oh. Uh, after the end of, like, apparently there was a lot more blackmailing and stuff going on. Who knows? Yeah, that's got to make you some enemies. Mm-hmm. That line of work. Yep. Which is a shame, but you know what? In this story, this story has a happy ending. We it learn does. that later. Yes. Um, yeah, everything goes great. Um, everything's fine. They last a whole year, at least. Are there parts of this that you wish they would have got into the movie? And are there parts for the movie that you wish uh, would have been originally put I, into the story? 
honestly, it's it's a little odd for me in that I, okay, other than like I cannot picture Johnny and Ralphie as anything other than at this point Keanu Reeves and Udo Kier. Yes, um, absolutely. Everything like the entire rest of and the to be story, fair, Ralphie is not described anything like. <laughs> No, Udo no, Kier not even story. slightly. But I think Udo Kier has such a gives such a fucking wild ass performance. Yeah, um, I that infected the story, and Johnny in the story is enough of a blank slate that right. he looks like Keanu Reeves. Who cares? I yeah. mean, you know, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, I can, I can Keanu Reeves in the nineties. Yeah. I can absolutely picture fucking Keanu Reeves with an Adidas, uh, duffel bag on his arm. Yeah. So they honestly, this story and the, the movie exist in almost entirely separate planes for me. They're sort of unrelated. Like I don't, I don't think of Jane in the books at all, or I don't think of Molly in the books at all as Jane. Yeah, me either. Like, it's, uh, I don't know, and it's, I'm sure, partially because I read this story and all the books long before the movie came out. Um, They're, like, you know, they're completely different but related. I wonder why Jane was toned down so much for, or, sorry, why Molly was toned down so much for the movie. Um, It's not that she's a bad character. She's just a different character. Yeah. She's not nearly as... Uh, she seems a lot more insecure in the movie, put it that way. She's looking for work in the same way that Molly is, but mm-hmm. she seems like she's struggling with her own security a little bit. Maybe uh, that just because that makes a more compelling. Yeah, I think that allows for more of an arc yeah. in, in the movie. Uh, also, they were contractually prohibited from having her be Molly, um, even though she's almost exactly Molly, except for the name. But, right. And um, the razors. Yeah. And the eye shields. She's not Molly at all. Yeah. Um, you know, part of that was probably simply a matter of what's going to look good on film. You know, kind of what's what's shootable and easy. Yeah. Um, and then also legal issues, because, you know, when Johnny Mnemonic got made, there was a different studio. I don't remember who, who had the rights to a Neurobancer, where, which owned Molly, effectively. Right. Well, uh, like I said, I don't think their choices were wrong in the movie, but it's it's definitely not Molly. I think they succeeded on yeah. that. Yeah, and I th- I really think the movie like the movie is successful in ways that the short story is not. I mean, it's telling just a totally different fucking like you have the very basics of okay, this guy's got some data in his head. Somebody wants to kill him, and that somebody is the Yakuza. I mean, yeah. that's really what they have in common. Um, the rest of it's been changed enough and is different enough that so, I mean, you know. I would have liked to have seen it be more like the sprawl in the movie and less like yeah. Newark. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, that's it didn't feel like a sprawl. It felt like Newark, honestly. Uh, that's also... Uh, I think that's a matter of them setting it January 17, 2021. Yeah. Um, true. In the Very movie. True, they actually say at some point in this story, they mentioned turn of the century. Yeah. Which, um, God, I mean, I, I guess, I don't know, looking at it 50 years on or whatever the 20, 40 years on, maybe he did mean the, the 20th century or the 21st century, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, as much trouble as Gibson goes to to not specify a date yeah. for the uh, sprawl books, it's definitely much further along than 2021 was. Yeah. In Johnny Mnemonic, the movie. Well, um, so what'd you think? Was it good? Yeah, I liked it. Of course, of course, I liked it. I remember liking it in high school. I knew I'd like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I the only quibbles I have are can pretty much be chalked up to, you know, William Gibson was uh, very young and this is one of his first things he wrote. Yeah. He had literally never written a novel at yeah. this point. So like my he was, minor, he was four years away from completing a novel. <laughs> my minor complaints uh, can basically be 
hand waved away by that. And even then it's still very good. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really like it really fucking pops. Um, it's a great little look into this world that really nothing like it had ever existed before this. Yeah. And it like, it's also the fact that it is recognizably the sprawl yeah. and Molly. And I mean, like this world that you get glimpses of in this 20 page short story is f- much so fleshed out over the course of three fucking novels and another two or three short stories and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, this is clearly like, oh yeah, he really fucking hit on something and had a very solid picture of what it was going to be. It's also a nice little opener for what what it becomes because you remember, you were like, remember, think back to the first time you saw the movie Scream and how the whole first thing is Drew Barrymore who was so hot at that moment. Yeah. And then, spoiler so alert, right now. She uh she died like five minutes in, mm-hmm. and you you all your brain is left wondering, well, what would it what would her story have been like? Johnny yeah. is Drew Barrymore in that in this analogy. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah, I like that. We're gonna keep and, that. And there's Don't cut that. there's a <laughs> I'll, double I'll, it. I'll, I always keep it. In, it. When I make good points, I always keep it. In. Keep it in and double it. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll play it again after this. All right. Um, but there are are several stories like that i can't think of another one offhand maybe like i guess in a way game of thrones how they kill spoilers for game of thrones they kill a main character at the end of the first season wow you're wincing away from that it's ned stark guys (laughs) no fucking fucking sean bean (laughs) bleep that bleep that um yeah uh i like i like that as as a series whole i mean and i don't know if that definitely wasn't intentional but it i don't the fuck i'm talking about why am I doing this podcast? That's unclear. But we you know just what? needed something after uh, Creek of the Weekend. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we did it because we love the genre. We do. And we're going to love it some more in the future. Yeah. Sexually. <laughs> All right. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be back with another thing. And what do you think that thing's going to be? I think that thing is going to be a little novel called Trouble and Her Friends by Melissa Scott. We were recommended this by one of our patrons. So that just goes to show you, if you become a patron of the High Tech Low Life podcast and send us messages, we will listen to you. Yes. Also, you don't have to become a patron. Send us messages on Twitter. We'll just, listen to you. Just fucking tweet at us. Um, we are very happy and excited to get any sort of interaction about this show. <laughs> we are so lonely. <laughs> yes, true. But we were specifically by a patron recommended this and uh read some synopsis it looked interesting we will be honest uh josh is incapable of insincerity i can lie all day long Mm -hmm. um but we will give it our honest review and i hope i get it read while i'm traveling because that's the plan well i am going to drop it off at your house sometime either tonight or maybe tomorrow i don't know it'll depend on if i keep drinking Uh, (laughs) well please do it sober (laughs) Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, just uh, because I'm looking at the copy of this book that I uh, have, uh, it is the winner of the Lambda Literary Award, which is for uh, queer fiction. I, I think it's actually just lesbian fiction. My uh, uh, RIP, Sandra Moran, was a Lambda Award nominee a couple Very of cool. years ago. Um, and the description of this book uh, on the back. Oh, and uh, this is printed by Lathe Press. And it has a fucking uh, graphic on the back that says Paragons of Queer Speculative Fiction, which fucking great. I mean, like, it is so cool that that exists nowadays. Like, I don't know. Agreed. uh, Anyway, the description is one of the quintessential and award winning novels of the cyberpunk genre returns in a striking new edition. India Carless, alias Trouble, managed to stay one step ahead of the feds until she retired from life as a hacker and settled down to run a small network for an artist's co-op. Now someone has stolen her pseudonym and begun to use it for criminal hacking, so trouble returns. Once the fastest gun on the electronic frontier, she has been called out of retirement for one last fight, and it's a killer. 
Less than a hundred years from now, the forces of law and order crack down on the world of the internet. It is the closing of the frontier, the hip, noir adventurers who got by on wit, bravado, and drugs, who haunt the virtual worlds of the shadows of cyberspace, are up against the edges of civilization. Oh, uh, it's time to adapt or die. So... That is the description from the back of the book. I am excited. It was originally published in, I think, 1994? Um, yes, 94. That, that was the golden times. Yeah. It's, so. I, I do think, like, I had some trouble finding it um, other than just straight up purchasing it from Amazon, which is what we had to do. Um, it's There's no audiobook version. Uh, so, you know, you might not necessarily be able to get your hands on this one, but you do have three weeks to try if you're interested. So, yeah. That's part of the reasoning behind this. Yeah. Um, doing, am... doing books on the show is kind of weird because, you know, they take time to read. Everybody reads at different rates. It's hard to do one when we just, you know, like next week we're going to talk about a novel and you got to read it by then. It's Yeah. And I, I, I find it weirdly harder to read a book and take notes. Like yeah. it's a. Like, I can fucking sit there and watch a movie and just tap, 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 you know, type away. But it is a, like, there is some sort of weird disconnect in my brain where, okay, I have to stop reading. Okay, the chapter ended. Now I have to write notes about what this chapter was. It's yeah. Uh, very odd. Although we're actually literally trained to do that in school, but I, I understand. That's why I sucked at school. Hey, you're not the only one. <sighs> Um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. And thanks for the recommendo. We love recommendos. It's like two in the last couple of episodes that were directly submitted by listeners. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm excited to uh, read this. Uh, it ought to be it, it ought to be real interesting, especially um, when what we're a month out a little over a month out from a uh, from when gravity fails. Mm hmm. Um, Another like that was a surprisingly uh, sexually and gender progressive um, book to be reading. And this one won a Land Literary Award. So, you know, I think we're I think we're doing pretty good, even though we're a couple of fucking middle aged white guys. We're doing OK with the representation as far as stuff that we're looking at. We're, we're trying. We're yeah. doing our best. And if you have any more suggestions, let us fucking know. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, I I enjoy it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, I just realized that we forgot to do our ratings for Johnny Mnemonic. Let's do them real fast because we were over over the tight 90 officially. Five, 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 ten. OK, so you're giving it a five for story. Uh, Sure. <laughs> I, I just rattled off the top. Um <laughs> Uh, let's see. Fashion. I don't know. Adidas still exists. Story. Story. The 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 story of Johnny Mnemonic. It's simple. It's basic. I'm going seven. It's not its strong suit. It's. I mean, it's a short story. There's nothing. There's not. I think it's a very solid short story. Um, I will go eight. Okay. I mean, like I don't. I don't even know what a ten short story would be. But I don't either. But I have read some short stories that have like. Wait. Really. I know how to oh. read. I had them read to me. Okay. Um, no, I've read some short stories. Like uh, I had this little book of sci-fi short stories when I was in middle school, and a lot of a lot of them have been adapted to movies or Twilight Zone episodes or something. Okay. But some of them sure. like really moved me and stuck with me my whole life. Um, Influence. I got you. you got to give this. Uh, it's this one of the tops, 10. right? Yeah. This is a ten. I mean. Can't. I mean, it's I, it influenced Neuromancer, which influenced the whole fucking thing we're doing here. Yeah, I don't know if this is the chronologically first published William Gibson book involving the sprawl, uh, but it's certainly earlier. It's earlier than Burning Chrome and certainly way earlier than Neuromancer. And it gave us Molly Millions. So, yeah, he invented Razor Girls, motherfuckers. What we, do you want to do? Pres prescience. Uh... I sell dope to a fucking dolphin about once a week. So I'm calling it a 10 for precious. All right. I do not, but I have got my, uh, you haven't seen me in a while, but I did get my Doberman teeth implants. So oh, sweet. I'm going to give it a nine. 
they're coming in. You'll start to hear it as the show progresses. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, on a serious note, I guess I'll give it a seven for Prussians. I don't know. I don't know. That, that's a dumb category. Who came up with this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Style. Prussians. I'm going to give Style a nine. Yeah. It's just because, you know, I gave, we gave Neuromancer yeah, a nine. I th- so I, th- I think nine is a very solid, if nothing else. Um, you know, the descriptor of the fucking Yakuza. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I love the fact that my uh, bullshit, I have been gifted a Hawaiian shirt uh, aesthetic that I wear sometimes on the weekends Mm -hmm. will carry forward into the future. Also because you're a boogaloo boy. (sighs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's because my mom lives in Florida near a store that has clearance Columbia fishing shirts. <sighs> I'm um, so tired. Hand so raisers. Tired. I feel like I should give it a five. I'm only going to give it a four. Um, Fuck you. Okay. Uh, five hand raisers. Okay. I, no, it, I don't know this why. Is, this is king of hand raisers. I mean, yeah, it's the invention Molly. of hand raisers. But I feel like, I don't know. I don't know why. I, I just don't feel like it's perfect. All right. That's I could probably right. I could probably up that to four point five and feel comfortable. Fact, okay, I do that. Four point five. I this is illegible. This is pointless nonsense. <laughs> All right, let's let's end this, uh, guys. If you want to follow us on Patreon, it's uh, patreoncom slash life. Give us some money. We do some weird stuff with movies. We just put out one where we watched Brain Scan, which we thought we were going to cover on the show, but we did not because it's not cyberpunk. Yes, um, we've got a couple of uh, good, weird ideas coming up for that. Yeah, we're going to do some point in the future. Some weird, dumb shit on there. If you want to hear us do weird, dumb shit, uh, that's the place. Uh, Also, follow us on Twitter at Johnny60Seconds. Do you have the Blue Sky set up yet? I do not. We're going to be on Blue Sky soon, and I guess we'll start promoting that on here because Twitter's, Twitter's done for. Yeah, I haven't yet decided if I'm going to actually do anything with Blue Sky. I am registered thanks to one of our uh, one of our gracious listeners. Yeah, me too. Um, but I'm not read. Oh, I'm not. The show isn't registered, but I do have yeah. the invite code. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I don't know. I might just uh, you know go out in a blaze of glory on Twitter. Yeah, but means. if they start charging you money. Like, are you going to pay money to go out in a blaze of glory? Fuck no. Fuck no. I know. And I, I want to be able to talk to our listeners. So yeah. if it yeah. has to be Blue Sky, well, let's hope they open up to everybody soon. Yeah. Because um, we ain't, I would rather, I would rather kill myself, cut my own veins out of my wrists and hang myself with those veins than join threads. Oh, yeah. That sounds rough. I do not want to do that. No. Like... If it's a choice between if it's a choice between uh, joining threads or paying for Twitter, I'm choosing the fucking bullet. Yes, Every, always the bullet. One hundred percent of the time. <laughs> uh, thankfully, we don't live in a world where you have to choose between two social media sites or death. Yeah, we can just not be on social media. But you know. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Uh, bye, hey, everybody. Are, okay. Bye, bye. Um, are we gonna have a tight ninety? That'd be exciting. No. We're going to have like a tight 95. Hey, um, audience, if uh, they think you're crude, go technical. If they think you're technical, go crude. Yes. Bye. See ya. This has been the High Tech Low Life Podcast. Find us on Twitter at Johnny60Seconds. Email us at HighTechLowLifePodcast at gmail.com. And find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash HighTechLowLife. Theme music provided by Nia Lore at Neolore.com. Thank you for listening. for all the kids watching at home. Stay out of trouble.